Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. I recently had a chance to catch up with Will Hall at a mental health conference in Oakland. Will is a nationally recognized mental health advocate, counselor, and speaker. As a teenager, Will was a community organizer in peace, ecology, and anti-racism movements. But the trauma from his childhood and longtime struggles with emotional distress landed him in a psychiatric hospital at age 26. After a difficult year in San Francisco's mental health system, he learned to care for his wellness through holistic health and spirituality. I chatted with Will about stigma, the controversy around psychiatric medication, and how society defines normality. Well, thank you for being here today. Welcome to Oakland. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're certainly known internationally for your mental health advocacy and your education. Um, before we get into that, could you tell me a little bit about your story? Um, well, I was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, and that's a really big, scary word. It's kind of one of the worst things that you can um, label someone with in the mental health system. And that was a period of my life. Um, I was living in San Francisco, and I was really suffering a lot. Um, I was um, uh, wandering the streets. I wanted to, to kill myself. I was hearing really aggressive voices, really angry, aggressive voices. I was um, so frightened of my roommates that I would leave out the window of the apartment. I was convinced other people were planning things to hurt me or that I was in some kind of danger. And um, it was a really difficult uh, time in my life. And I ended up in the hospital. And you know, I, I really trace a lot of what I went through, both to the trauma that I experienced in my childhood with my family. My, my mother is a sexual abuse survivor, and my father is a Korean War veteran. And he was also in the mental health system. And, but there was also this other piece of my story, which was I always was someone who experienced very unusual states of consciousness. I always went into visionary states, extreme states. I would get very, very um, frightened and freeze and not talk. Or I would have a really ecstatic connection with nature and just be really fascinated with imaginary worlds. And, and so when I finally did end up in the hospital, I was looking for help. But the system really gave me more trauma. It really um, wasn't helpful to me. And I, I'm not against um, you know, people who are helped by hospitals. I know that is helpful to some people. But for me, my experience was, was of abuse. And so since then, I mean, I, I tried lots of different medications. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. They did all these tests on me. The medications weren't helpful. In fact, they were really harmful to me. And again, I, and I'm not anti-medication. There are many people who take medications, and they work for them. But for me, that wasn't, um, that wasn't the case. And then at some point, I really had to sort of find my own way out. I had to really start to rely on my own resources. I had to unlearn a lot of the things that I was taught by the doctors. And I had to. Um, go on a, an exploration, go on a journey um, into myself and to start exploring things. And one of the things that was most, there were many, many things that were helpful, but one of the things that was most crucial was the peer movement and getting connected with people like Oryx Cohen and the folks with the Freedom Center in Western Massachusetts and being able to talk about things that I had never been able to talk about. And it's been a long, long process. I was on Social Security Disability for 10 years. I mean, you wouldn't really recognize me from those days from today. And now I've taken what I've learned in the peer movement, what I've learned from myself, the one-on-one -on -one, um, work that I've done. And I've, I've gone on to become a trainer. And I am actually um, have a degree. And I'm a therapist now in Portland, Oregon, and doing a lot of educational work around finding a different way to respond to people who are in extreme states so that people don't have to go through what I had to go through with the bad treatment and the misunderstanding of my experience. So your experience and your abuse in the system really inspired your activism? Absolutely. I was kind of drafted into being yeah, a mental health yeah, advocate. Yeah. So one of the things you're most known for is your pamphlet and your corresponding workshop on a harm reduction guide to coming off medications. Yeah. There is a commonly held belief in society as well as one held by a lot of psychiatric professionals that if you are diagnosed with a mental illness, medication mm -hmm. is the way to be treated, that there are biological causes involved for mental illness. What would you say to that? Well, I wish that there was a magic bullet, but unfortunately there, there isn't. And um, this is really a stereotype that schizophrenia, it's a brain disease, you treat the brain disease with a pill, and that's the best you can do. You can't cure it, but at least you can keep it under control. And again, I'm not anti-medication, but there isn't a scientific support or proof to say that we can look inside of brains and decide that this is the schizophrenic brain, this is the depressed no, brain. No they have not been able to find anything conclusive. And um, 
there's always hints, there's always possibilities, and of course biology plays a role in everything, but in terms of whether it's actually determinant or destiny, they haven't ever come up with that test that can discriminate. And the other key thing is that that's not how the drugs work. If you give an antipsychotic drug to animal, if you give an antipsychotic drug to someone who's not diagnosed with schizophrenia, they're also going to have that tranquilizing effect. And this is something that I had to learn for myself because I was told that, well, these drugs are treatments for disease, and therefore you need it. And so I felt like there was something wrong with me when I wasn't responding to the drugs or when things got worse. And then I learned that actually those messages were really backwards, that these aren't treatments for disease. These are drugs that are really tranquilizing us or stimulating us. Often it's just the placebo effect. It's the belief in the drug. And sometimes that can be helpful, but not for the reasons that we think. And when I started doing peer um, recovery work, a lot of people would come to our support groups with really basic questions. They had no idea about their medications. And one of the things was, well, is it possible to live without medications? Can I come off my medications? And this has become like a huge taboo topic. I think that there's a lot of fear around it, but the reality is that it's more dangerous to not talk about coming off medications than it is to try and have open conversations. And that's because people are already trying to come off their medications. The side effects are horrible. The long-term risks are very severe, uh, all the way to, to possibly being life-threatening. Um, sometimes they, the medications can make psychosis worse. They can dramatically um, lower the quality of life. And so there are a lot of really good reasons for people to want medication alternatives. And again, I'm not anti-medications. A lot of people find them helpful. But what we found is that doctors don't have the information. Therapists are afraid. The society isn't providing the information. The pharmaceutical companies want to keep, get people on the drugs, and their answer is more drugs, not getting people off. So we had to develop our own way of approaching this problem. And the way I look at it is that any liberation movement, whether it's the gay rights movement or the civil rights movement or the women's movement, has always had to challenge the science, has always had to challenge the medical profession that was saying, well, midwives aren't, aren't any good. You just should go to the doctor. Well, actually, it's the women's movement that challenged that. And now we accept that midwives are a valid approach. And that's exactly what, what we're doing with this, um, this educational work around coming off medications. People need information. They need some kind of support. And um, the most important thing is that you want to be smart about it. And people were going off without any kind of information. They were going off without any really kind of, of guidance. And now the guide that I wrote, the Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs, has been translated to many different languages. It's been downloaded um, off the internet, internet thousands of times. It's available for free online. And what we find is that you know a harm reduction approach is really the way to go, to not to say that it's better to be off medications or that it's better to be on medications, to take an approach where you're really meeting people where they're at and being flexible with um, their experience. And there are a few basic guidelines, like usually going slower is better. I mean, we know from when you're taking coffee, you're drinking coffee, and that caffeine is affecting you. If you go cold turkey off of that caffeine that you're taking every day, you're going to get headaches. So it's a similar principle with, with medications. Exactly, exactly. So going off slowly, withdrawing step by step is often the best way to go, although everybody's um, different. The other thing we also have learned is that um, the withdrawal effects themselves sometimes can look like psychosis. Mm -hmm. So people start to withdraw, they have a psychosis, and then people say, ah, that's your disease coming back. You need the medications. Rather than thinking, well, actually, maybe that's the medications that's causing that. Maybe you should go slower. People get into this kind of catch-22 Trap. And the other well, that's thing, probably something the person on the medication also thinks. It can be, and that's because they haven't been given right. the right that's information. Right. And the one thing about it is that you know it does sometimes take years for people to come off. I mean, a general rule of thumb is the longer you've been on, the longer that it can take to come off. But again, there are people who go off faster, and there's a big diversity out there. Um, the placebo effect and expectations and individual difference is huge. But generally speaking, um, people um, do um, do better if they take longer, if they've been on the medications longer. And um, you know, everybody, I think, deserves a chance to um, experiment and explore and to try and to go slowly and see if it's right for them. A lot of people, they get in their head that they really want to go completely off. And then they start, and they find that just by reducing, they feel so much better. And they find that actually they do really well on a lower dose of medication. And then it's great. Then stay at that, at that level. It's always a risk-benefit analysis for you individually. 
So you're a real believer and a real proponent of talking about taboo topics, about not sweeping things under the rug that society might find scary or potentially shameful to really have a discussion. One of the things that you talk about so openly is the fact that you still have suicidal feelings and how they shape you. And not only would a lot of people never mention that, but they probably wonder, oh my gosh, why does he do this? Why is he so open and and vulnerable? Um, What do you hope to achieve by sharing that part of yourself and having a discussion around that? Well, this is really about stigma. This is about how we overcome people's isolation and the shame and the pushing things off into the shadows. And it's such a big part of mental health problems is not being able to talk about them. And one of the things that you learn if you do break that taboo and you start to ask people, you find that it's actually a lot more common than you would think for people to have suicidal feelings. And uh, for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very committed to life. I, I'm not going to end my end my life, I'm, I'm very much uh, someone who is not um, going to act on those feelings. But at the same time, I do sometimes have really strong feelings of wanting, wanting to die. And so talking about it is a way of helping people to realize that they can live with those feelings. I think that people have suicidal feelings, and then they don't have anywhere to go. One of the things that happens is that people learn very quickly that if you tell the wrong person that you're feeling suicidal, that person is going to overreact. They're going to come at you with a fear response, and that could lead you to losing your freedom. They, in the name of helping you and protecting you, you could end up locked up and, and being in a hospital. And maybe for some people that is an experience of safety, but for a lot of us that's been an experience of more trauma and more abuse, and it's not a safe place to be. So the research is really clear that feeling suicidal is much more common than we realize. And, and actually, I think that the key thing is to be able to get it out in the open so that we can help each other so that we're not isolated. I think that's how we prevent suicide, is by actually making that connection. And there's this idea that, that people who um, are having suicidal feelings have given up on life. Well, I don't think that's true. I think someone who's given up on life, they go to work, they come home, they watch TV, they don't really care about much. That's someone who's given up on life. Someone who has suicidal feelings has a huge demand for a change. Maybe they want to end the pain that they're in. Maybe they want to get something in their life that's meaningful to them that they don't feel like they can get. Maybe there's some situation or some life dream that they feel cut off from. And so they want a change in their life, but they feel powerless to get it. And that's why people have this um, experience of both wanting to die and then also reaching out, telling people about it. They're not just, some people just go and end their lives, and it's often a great mystery because they never really talked about it, but usually people have that conflict. I know with me, it's a wake-up call. It's something that says, hey, Will, something's got to change. And if instead of reacting to myself and kind of pathologizing myself and labeling myself, if I actually listen to that part of myself with some compassion and curiosity, it has a message for me. It says, hey, it's this really is... It's beneficial, actually. It, it can be. You know, once you come to the other side of it, it can be, hey, you need to change this. And then I think, okay, I want to change. I want it so bad, I feel like I'm going to die if I don't have that change. How do I get the power to at least make some steps to get on the road towards making that change? And then it can guide you in another direction. So, well, You mentioned that you grew up and had some trauma in your life, yeah, both yeah. you and your brother, probably, of course, a result of the trauma that your parents faced and was passed down. How relevant do you think trauma is in people's mental health issue and mental illnesses? Like I said earlier, we talked about society really has that view that there's biological causes, but not necessarily environmental causes or experiences like trauma. How, how real do you think that is? I, most of the people that I've talked to who have a schizophrenia or a bipolar diagnosis, or even people with a depression diagnosis or who are struggling with anxiety, have some trauma. And they can often trace their experiences back. And I mean, I love my family. I mean, I don't blame my family at all, but I think we need to be honest about the fact that families often have traumatic legacies. They often are abusive to their children, or they don't provide a supportive environment. Often the parents are themselves survivors of trauma, and that was my my experience. And it wasn't just family trauma. I also experienced um, trauma with bullying in school. And so I really learned that, for example, I um, had a very aggressive voice that I heard when I first went into the hospital. And no professional ever asked me, you know, what does the voice say? What does it sound like? Is it familiar? Never? Never, ever. It was just, you're hearing voices? Ah, that's a symptom of psychosis and schizophrenia. And so I, um, they were interested in my family history, but they were interested in genetics. They weren't interested in right. trauma history. And so when I f- first started to say, well, wait a second, what does that voice 
actually sound like? What is it, does it remind me? Wait a second, that's a familiar, I realized it was my father's voice. And I trace that aggressive voice to the trauma that I experienced and the messages, the things that my father used to, to say to me. And so then it becomes a process of like any kind of bullying, except this is now inner bullying, fighting back and standing up for myself and saying, no, don't, don't treat me like this. I don't deserve to be yelled at to this voice in my head. And that was very, very helpful to me, connecting it back to the story and also realizing that it was a process of standing up to that. And in terms of voices, I mean, I've heard many, many different kinds of voices. And the word voices, I don't know if I like that word because often it's presences or it's spirits or it's experiences that I have. Some of the, um, the voices that I have are also very positive and can be very helpful. And when I go down into my really dark places now and I'm feeling suicidal, sometimes those voices will be there. And it's really, when it's really bad, they aren't there. But they often come to me and they help me and they support me. And they, throughout history, you know, there's many, many cultures where not hearing a voice is a problem because the culture is all about the ancestors and spirits. And we need to have much more of a diversity-based based approach to these kinds of, of experiences, I think. Do you think that if more people knew the connection between trauma and mental illness or mental health issues in society, that there would be less stigma and more kindness? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that rather than seeing people as something is different about you, you see them as a survivor of something extreme. They're giving a normal and often creative response to an abnormal and ex extreme uh, circumstance that they've lived through. And it creates a, a situation of greater compassion. And a lot of the research has been directed towards chemistry and genetics and um, pharmacology and all this kind of stuff. But actually, there is a swing back now happening to looking at the connections between childhood trauma and um, adult diagnosis of severe mental illness. And the connections are very clear. The research really does show that. You mentioned just a minute ago that there are other cultures in the world where hearing voices is celebrated and it's not considered a disorder. And it's really sort of our Western definition or U.S. definition of the disorder that's getting us into trouble. What do you think we can do as a society to redefine the concept of a disorder and what it means to have a disorder? That's a, that's a great question. That's why I like this idea of mental diversity. I mean, we live in a multicultural society. And my view is that the medical system, the, the diagnostic system, the DSM, American psychiatry, Western science of, of mental illness um, that gets called mental illness, it claims to be scientific. It claims to have objective truth and facts on its side. When you look at it, actually, it doesn't have that scientific basis. It doesn't have that objective claim to truth. It becomes one more cultural point of view. And so if you impose one cultural point of view and call it scientific objectivity on a whole multicultural society, what you're basically doing is colonialism. And so I feel like we need to have a view that says, look, there are different ways of understanding these experiences. I'm not romanticizing voice hearing. I mean, it's horrific and can be very, very um, painful and, and extremely terrifying, as well as sometimes being positive. But we should recognize that other cultures have other ways of, of confronting that and engaging with it, rather than saying, you know, you're different than us, we're going to push you away and give you this mental illness label. Actually, we've got a whole process for initiating someone into becoming a medicine person. We're going to help you understand that your destiny is to be a shaman. Maybe you're um, possessed by spirits. Well, we understand how to deal with that. We will help you to go through that, and then you'll come out of it. And there are cultures that have actually, actually better recovery rates with these kinds of approaches. And again, I'm not trying to romanticize that. But we have a lot of lessons to learn, and we need to not be colonialist. And one of the things that was most important for me is my mom is mixed race American Indian from the Choctaw tribe. And she didn't grow up in a reservation. She wasn't part of that living tradition. But it did get carried through in her ancestry. And so I always learned that there's something more. There's something deeper. There's something spiritual. And so my view now is a much more spiritual perspective where when I have these unusual or sometimes scary experiences, I don't automatically pathologize myself and label myself and say, oh, that's a symptom of my disease coming back. I have much more of an open approach and a much more accepting and, and curious stance. Well, hearing you tell your story and hearing you speak, it seems like you are the one who did most of the work in getting yourself better. You know, you went to 
outside help, you know, at hospitals with psychiatric professionals that in a lot of cases made you worse, but that's really this process of you looking in yourself and analyzing yourself and coming to peace yourself. A lot of people, I don't think, are in a space to be that enlightened, and like you said, it takes time. So what would you say to someone who might be struggling with something like you did but might not be as enlightened as you are or might not have gone down the path yet that you that you've traveled and gotten to the point that you are? Well, I mean, I did have a lot of help from a lot of different people. I mean, like I said, I mean, I've been through this many, many years journey. But I mean, what I would say to people is the peer movement. Mm -hmm. What I would say to people is get access to stories that aren't the mainstream stories that you hear. Learn about the diversity of different ways of engaging with this. And start to experiment. Have a trial and, um, a trial and an error attitude. Look at things like um, nutrition and food allergies. Look at things like your sleep patterns. Start to look at things like what are the quality of your friendships and your relationship. I really think that what we call mental illness is a combination of two things, powerlessness and isolation. Mm -hmm. And we need to really think about how do we build relationships with people. And this is why the peer recovery movement is so, so important. I would really encourage people to think beyond the messages that they've been getting from doctors and the ads on television from pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies to start exploring alternative ways of understanding these experiences and to recognize that maybe you know maybe you're sensitive maybe you're creative maybe you even have a gift but you've learned to be so afraid of these parts of yourself that you're reacting and putting things in a box and i know that that's easier said than done and sometimes it can take years and years but i think that there's a big lesson from any kind of human encounter with overwhelming odds i mean if you i love to read survival stories of people who are adrift at sea or trapped on the sides of, of mountains. And you know, when I was at that point at the Golden Gate Bridge and I was looking down, I was really thinking of, of ending my life. Just It would have been so easy in a sense, just making a, a step and climbing over the, the railing there. When I reached that point of, of encountering that extreme circumstance, I discovered something inside of myself. And this is really part of the human mystery. People encounter any kind of survival situation. Something can kick in inside of you and it's surprising it sometimes feels like grace and so i think to have a certain kind of faith that you have this power in yourself and it's like it's like anything you know don't give up keep exploring keep going don't settle if it doesn't feel right for you don't settle just keep going and keep doing the best that you can and don't accept being isolated always reach out and try and get connected and the peer movement is so important for that so it often seems that once someone enters the mental health system, they're fighting a losing battle. And in your harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric medication, you write that there's a legacy of violent and abusive treatment towards psychiatric patients, particularly in hospitals and otherwise. You also state, for the mental health system, it's one size fits all, regardless of the human cost. That paragraph is kind of a downer. It so kind of do, downer, you, yeah. do you have hope that the mental health system can ever change for the better? And if so, how do you see that happening? I, the reality is that it, it has changed. I mean, the, um, the activism and advocacy has led to tens of billions of dollars of settlements against drug companies, for example. I mean, the states have sued the drug companies. There's been all kinds of investigations into the scandals. And so there has been pro uh, progress. Uh, when the Zyprexa was introduced, there was an active hiding of the risks and an active uh, law breaking around marketing and that came to light. So we are seeing um, a change where drug companies aren't just held up as saviors and doing um, just totally positive good work. They're really seen with a greater scrutiny now. Um, a lot of the protections in place in the mental health system didn't exist until the psychiatric survivor movement came along in the 70s and 80s um, as part of the wave of the civil rights movement and the women's movement to really challenge it. So we've seen a lot of changes in our society, but at the same time, there's all these different forces that are driving the other direction. I mean, people are having to work so hard with so much pressure on us. There's so little community. There's so little of that natural social connection that really helps us and supports us. A lot of people are, are turning to the magic bullet, the pill, the solution in uh, getting a prescription, and that's become part of the mentality of our culture. And so I, what I see, I see really it's a liberation movement. People who don't have a voice, who haven't been given a voice, who've been actively suppressed with their voice, finally coming out of the, of the shadows and starting to challenge and to take back uh, some power. And although I think we have a long way 
to go. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of the practices in the United States are being exported around the world. There have been real changes. And one of the things that's new on the scene is the peer recovery movement. And more and more of the mental health agencies around the country and the state mental health departments are adopting a recovery perspective. They're bringing peers um, into the workforce in terms of providing services. And I have to say, when I first started doing this work around coming off medications, the reaction was, oh, you're, you're pushing anti-medications. You must be a Scientologist. You're, you have this agenda. Rather than just saying, look, this is information that's missing that we need to provide to people. You're not providing the information, so we're doing it ourselves. And so when we first came out with that, we were just shut out. And now we're being invited to conferences. There's trainings. I was just in uh, Vermont with the, De the Vermont Department of Mental Health doing trainings on coming off medications. So I see a real um, sea change. I think we need to keep, keep pushing. And so the issues around issues like um, hearing voices and the, the importance of, of, of addressing suicidal feelings without that fear-based response that says we automatically have to force people into the hospital. We still have a lot of way, long way to go. But I think we can keep bringing this up. And ultimately, I think we ultimately are going to win because this does affect everyone. And all of us can benefit from a more um, open and compassionate and heartful response to me mental health problems. Well, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. And best of luck in your continued work. Shannon, I really appreciate you having thank me on you. the show. Thank you. To access Will's harm reduction guide for coming off psychiatric drugs, visit willhall.net slash coming off meds. To listen to Madness Radio, the show hosted and produced by Will, visit madnessradio.net or iTunes. To learn more about the Freedom Center, a support and activism community run by and for people labeled with severe mental disorders, visit freedom-center.org. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.